Without Jesus, it would be impossible for us to ever know the Father. He's the most wonderful person to know. And without the Holy Spirit, we'd never know Jesus. <laughs> He's the one who's come to glorify Him. He's the one who come to make Him known. And uh, we, have a, we have a lost and dying world around us that they, they in pain. They groaning right now. They suffering in travail, desperate need to see Jesus. They are. It can be seated. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you right now in the mighty name of Jesus that every mind-blinding spirit will be broken right now. That the eyes will be opened to be able to see that every distraction that the enemy would try to bring against the souls of men would be put to nothing right now. That every disease and every sickness, every fetter, every pain, every oppression, every torment in Jesus' mighty name has to release you now, has to go. Has to, can have no effect upon any life in this place. By the power of the living God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the way the gospel works. Jesus said, I've been anointed by the Holy Ghost to preach the gospel to the poor. To bind up the broken in heart. To proclaim liberty to the captives. The opening of the prison doors to those that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus said that. It's written down in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. It was something that Israel at the time understood to be that ministry belonging to the Messiah that was to come. The prophet Isaiah had made it known previously in Isaiah chapter 61. But this is the ministry of Jesus Christ. Paul comes along. God reveals himself, Christ Jesus reveals himself to the Apostle Paul, who at that time was named Saul, a man who had set himself against the church because the church represented to him everything that was evil, everything that was blasphemous, everything that was against the culture of the kingdom of God. And he had set himself to destroy anybody who believed in this blasphemer named Jesus Christ. And on the way to Damascus, when he had received, an, received authority to bind Christians, suddenly in the way, Christ Jesus appeared to him. He falling down to the ground said, Lord, who are you? He said, I am Jesus, the Christ whom you persecute. From that day forward, Paul's life was tur told, totally turned around. The power of the Holy Ghost came upon him. And absolutely equipped him and empowered him to be the most radical follower of Jesus that any of us know about. God used him to write two-thirds of the New Testament. But in reality of it is, I truly believe that all the rest of the disciples of that day were just as radical as Paul. It's just that, by and large, the New Testament focuses on the ministry of Paul. If all the books... <laughs> that should be written about Jesus Christ alone. If they were written, <laughs> John said, I suppose that the whole world couldn't contain it. I mean, think about one day in the life of the ministry of Jesus as it's captured in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 4 when John sent disciples to Jesus inquiring whether he was the Christ or whether they, they should look for another. Some people don't understand that, but reality of it is, is John and everybody else was wrapped up in the doctrines and the concepts of their day and of their time. They believed that when the Messiah came, that the eternal kingdom would be set up. And what John was seeing was just the opposite. He was hearing rumors then by that time he'd been in prison for about six months. He was hearing rumors of how they were going to take and kill Jesus the Christ. So he, sends, he says, says, says to his disciples, go see. He'll tell you the truth. And of course, he, John had received witness. In fact, John the Baptist probably was the cousin of the Lord Jesus Christ. He had received witness from heaven. But he had a moment of wondering. So for, for certainty's sake... He sent his disciples, and we see one day in the life of Jesus Christ manifested. And when you look at that verse of Scripture, what do you see? 
You see, in Matthew 11, chapter 4, in that self-same hour, that same time, the blind received their sight, the crippled walk, the lepers were cleansed of their disease. He says that the lame walked. Every kind of, every kind of miracle that you can imagine would begin to take place. And the dead were raised to life again, all in one little, one little meeting. See, for me, that defines church. I can't define church any other thing, any other way outside of the ministry and person of Jesus Christ. He came to us showing us everything that belonged to heaven. Showing us the liberation that comes when somebody encounters the goodness of God. And he told you and I, he told the disciples then and he tells us today to come follow him. He told the disciples then that they would receive power from on high to be his witnesses, to be the proof providers. That without that power, without that authority, it would be impossible for them to give proof or give witness of who he was and who he is. Nothing's changed. If they needed to give proof, those who were with him, and they needed power and authority for their day, how much more do you and I need it for our day? All we have to do is just change a little bit of thinking. Change a little bit of our perspective on things. Start agreeing with what God says, what his glorious church ought to look like. His church is supposed to be the fullness of him that fills all things. That's the glory and power of God. I don't have to wonder as to what Peter preached. I know what Peter preached. He preached Jesus in such a way. He preached the same Jesus in such a way. The authority of Jesus that when he came to town, the way that they did evangelism is they go bang on the door, say, bring your sick and disease, lay him into the street. If Peter's shadow passes over them, they'll be healed. Pretty radical, isn't it? I know what Paul preached. It was obvious what Paul preached. The scripture says in Romans chapter 15 and verse 19, he said, I have fully preached the gospel from Jerusalem to Illyricum so that through mighty signs and wonders and the power of the Holy Ghost, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ might be made known. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 4, he said, I'm not come preaching with the elegance of men's speech. I'm not come and give to you a good, a good message Declaring to you the gospel and the wisdom which men's words can communicate. But I come preaching the gospel with the demonstration of the Holy Ghost and power. The question is why? He said, lest your faith should be in men and not in the power of God. There's an amazing thing. <laughs> when, you, when you think about John 3, 16, what a glorious verse of scripture, right? Everybody knows that verse of scripture. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believed should not perish, but have everlasting life, unlimited life, immeasurable life. But guess what? Luke chapter 3, verse 16, is just as important as John chapter 3, verse 16. Luke chapter 3, verse 16, declares the ministry of Jesus. Jesus said he would baptize us. He would be the one, rather John said, he would be the one who would baptize us in the Holy Ghost and fire. A ministry that didn't start till after Jesus ascended up on high. And yet somehow we have, we've been willing to replace religion for this wonderful, glorious event of the power of God in our life. And that's got to change. And it's not going to change in the world. It's going to change in the church. And now we live in a day that is worse than any time ever before because we live in that day and that time where we're approaching the soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everybody who talked about this day said it would be a day of great apostasy. It would be a day of perilous times where men would depart from the faith, giving the heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We don't have to sit around and wonder who's right and who's wrong. Look, Jesus is right. We can look at Matthew, Mark, and John and we can see the ministry of Jesus. We don't need concordances. We don't need dictionaries. We don't need volumes of commentary. We've got everything that we need contained with just within the four Gospels alone to know who Jesus Christ is and what the will of the Father is. And then when you take the book of Acts and you bring it to bear as we see the church come alive, the church, it was born... Whatever a thing is born to be, or born in, or born of, that is what it's born to be. The church was born in the baptism of the fire of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the fire of God's presence. That's the day it was born, Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost was fully come. They are all gathered together in one place. 
And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as the sound of a rushing mighty wind and filled the place who, where they were gathered. And, and there came to rest upon each one of them clothed in tongues of fire. And they all again began to speak with other languages as the Holy Ghost gave them utterance. When Jesus had already prophesied it, he said in Mark 16, 17, before he went away, he said, they that believe these miracles will follow them. In my name, they will cast out devils and they will speak with new tongues, tongues that have never been heard before. And here we are today in a place now where like never before, the light of the gospel needs to shine. Like never before, the fire of God needs to come to bear. Jesus speaks to his church in, in Revelation chapter 3. And he tells his church, a church that is bent on pleasing people, a Laodicean church, bent on pleasing people. He said, I'd rather you be hot or cold, but if you're lukewarm, I'm not going to have anything to do with you. And he says that he uses the Hebrew idiom to express this unwillingness to be around any people like this. What is lukewarm? Lukewarm is a misrepresentation, a false representation of Jesus. That's why it's so bad. It's a misrepresentation of the gospel, a misrepresentation of the will of the Father. That's why it's so repulsive. That's why it was so repulsive to God in the Old Testament because of the misrepresentation that his people gave of him. He says, he used a Hebrew idiom. He said, I'll spit you or spew you, literally vomit you, which is a very grotesque word. But literally, if you get real with the language, it literally says, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. It is the most repulsive uh, statement that you can make to someone concerning how you feel about them. And that's how Jesus feels about a lukewarm church. That's how he feels about a lukewarm people. Nothing's changed. And then we go, okay, well, I don't want to be lukewarm. And, and if we make an altar call, if you feel like you're lukewarm and you want to get hot again, come to the altar. People come to the altar, but do they understand the temperature change? And that what God describes as hot is being on fire in the fire of God. That's what he said. Come, I counsel you to buy of me gold on fire in the fire. Amen. As soon as you take gold out of the fire, you, in the fire you can get gold to 100% pure. I know chemists don't like that, but they'll recognize that if it's, if it's at a right temperature, it's true. Because everybody th thinks that there can be no absolute, so it's got to be 99.999999999%. But you know what I mean. As soon as you take it out of the fire, guess what happens? It captures impurities. It can never be as pure as it is on the fire, in the fire. Jesus said, I counsel you to buy, buy of me gold on fire in the fire. A faith realm. Think about this with me, people. What well, God has given us an opportunity to, to do. People call it legalism. No, it's liberation. People somehow make it as though it's some kind of a burden or duty. No, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity. It's the greatest opportunity that's ever been made. I don't know about you, but in my life, I've been living 54 years. I've had many amazing opportunities given to me. Amazing opportunities with, within the, the realms of finances and other areas and opportunities and positions and whatnot. But never has an opportunity come to us as the opportunity that God has given to us in Christ Jesus, where Jesus says, come and dwell in me. If you'll come dwell in me and my word abides in you, you'll ask whatever you want and it'll be done. If you come abide in me, in other words, you draw all your identity from me, all the meaning and value of life is in me. Satan's primary objective is to do whatever he can do through his condemning powers to try to disassociate you from Christ Jesus, to draw a wedge or to make you feel distance in any way. That's the work of Satan. He uses it through thoughts that he had tried to communicate to you and through others. And I'm telling you, if you take a hold of this grace of God, come and abide in Christ Jesus, and then let his word abide in you so that it becomes the motivator of your dreams, your vision, your purpose, your direction in life, what you believe, what you lay hold on, the things that you call reality. He said, then you'll ask whatever you want and it'll be done. That's what he said, John 15, 7. I'm going to hang with the words of Jesus. Listen, I've been around the Bible. I've heard sermons. I've heard preachers. I've been blessed to be in a great company of God's people all of my life. But I'm telling you, I'm absolutely going to go with what Jesus Christ had to say. He's called us to come and follow him. He said, on that day, my word will judge you. <laughs> you know, 
prepare for your final exams. Read the Bible. <laughs> you don't have to have special glasses. It's not open for anybody's interpretation. People, I hear this all the time. Oh, that's your opinion. That's your interpretation. Well, the Scripture says it's not for anybody's opinion. God said this isn't for any private opinion. This is wide open. This is very clear for everyone to see. Somebody said, oh, it's all, it's all symbolic. Well, come, let's play Bible trivia. You know, come on. Huh? Who, who did, what giant did David kill? He's got a name. That's a literal name, a little person, a literal event. Who was the mother of Jesus? It's got a, she's got a literal name. It was a real true event. Was it a virgin birth? Yeah, explain that. <laughs> because if there's anything hard to explain in the Bible, it would be that. How God became a holy embryo. And if that's real, and if that's literal, if that's the basis of our faith, how then can we make everything else subjective? Why is it that we make everything so true and so objective within the framework of academics and the framework of our businesses and our jobs and our relationships, but when it gets to God, it's just touchy-feely. I'm telling you, it's not that way at all. His word is powerful. His word is living. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Jesus said, the word which I speak to you is spirit and it's life. Man, the word of God is so powerful that it will change everything about your life. It framed the heavens. God, Christ Jesus, upholds it by the word of his power. That is the world's. <laughs> you and I draw our breath today because of his mercy, because of his love. I think one of the saddest verses in the scripture in the Bible is found in Genesis chapter 3 where the scripture reads that Adam heard God moving to the spirit of the day. And I know if you open your Bibles there, you see that. Um, I, I believe it's verse 6, but we can tell when we get over there. I'm um, in Genesis chapter uh, 3. I know King James says that um, God... That Adam heard the voice of God, but I'm going to kind of give you a, uh, a little bit of a loose translation from the Hebrew Bible, okay? Um, in verse 8, and they heard the voice of God, the Lord God, walking in the garden. And King James says in the cool of the day, and NIV says another thing, and Amplify says another thing, and Revised Version says another little bit of a different thing. But literally it says he came walking or moving because it's the hithel form of the verb for walk in the Hebrew language which literally means to move. And the word that is used or trans translated here, cool of the day, literally is ruach, which is in the Hebrew language a, the word for spirit. He came moving to the spirit of the day. In other words, he came moving in his divine purposes and he's calling out and he's saying to Adam, Adam, where are you? Look at that. He heard the voice of God in the garden. And the Lord called out to Adam saying, Adam, where are you at? And what did Adam, where was Adam? He was hiding in his sin and shame. He was hiding in the chaos of darkness. He was hiding in an unrealized expectation that came upon him because of the deception of Satan. I think about it for just a minute. I just hold your finger on this, just for this thought for just a minute. The mighty angels that stood around God beholding his glory, crying day and night, holy, 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 was deceived by Satan's lies. I, I don't doubt that that deception was very similar to the deception that Satan used against Eve here in the garden trying to bring God into question, bring God's motives into question, and dividing those whom he loves and those who he's created for, 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 for his pleasure, but for also for their prosperity and blessing. He divides them away from the presence of God. Can you imagine the mighty host of angels who stood in the presence of God beholding his glory, being able to be deceived by Satan? <laughs> How much, how much better off do you believe you are than they? Have you ever stood in the presence of God, beholding him face to face, around the, around the throne upon the crystal sea, beholding all his divine glory and all of his ways for who knows how long, an undefined period of time, and somehow they can be deceived? 
People, I want you to understand, you, listen to me, listen to me. You and I need to grab a hold of the Word of God and hold on to the Word of God. And there's a lot of people saying a bunch of different things about the Word of God. But reality of it is, when you take the Word and you hold it to the proofs that there needs to be two or three witnesses on any given point, and then furthermore, you look at the example of Jesus Christ set before us, how can you... There, God has made a way where we cannot be deceived. He sent us the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, to come and lead us and to guide us in all truth. And He testifies of Jesus Christ only declaring and speaking this word of God. I, write, I was privileged to be raised around mighty men of God who are full of the Holy Ghost, who, was, who belonged to the same church that the Apostle Paul belonged to. I belong to the same church the Apostle Paul belongs to. It's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's one church. It hasn't changed. It's a glorious church. Praise God. I don't know what church you belong to. I belong to the one that Jesus baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire. And that's the only one I want to belong to. And everybody gets the choice to choose. Because some people don't want to belong to the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire church. Some people don't want to belong to the church where we are baptized in His presence and in His likeness. Where we put on Christ Jesus and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Huh? Some people don't want to come and follow him and learn all the ways of God, of his character, of his nature, and of his power and of his authority. But I do. My choice is to be in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, a glorious church where, the, where, the, where each per person within the context of the church is as members in the body who function under an individual mandate by the Holy Ghost and who, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, to everyone is given the manifestation of the Holy Ghost. I want to learn how to yield to the teaching and the direction of the Holy Spirit. God invites you to come into the school of the Spirit and be taught of the Holy Ghost. To be led by Him, to walk in Him. What is He going to teach you? It's not subjective. It's not some arbitrary opinion about what He's going to teach you. <laughs> he's going to teach us how to walk like Jesus, talk like Jesus, be like Jesus. He's going to lead us and guide us into all the truth. He's, what, did, what did Jesus say about it? In John 16 and 13, he said, he's going to take everything that belongs to me and he's going to reveal it, transmit it, disclose it to you. He shall glorify me. He said, everything that belongs to the Father is mine. And he shall take everything that belongs to the Father and he shall make it known to you. Well, I don't need anybody to tell me anything different about this. Jesus said that. He said, this is what the Holy Ghost is going to do. And I can go and study about the Holy Ghost and I can come to realize the wonderful things that the Holy Spirit is doing. He's the spirit of holiness. Well, tell me, define holiness for me. And don't get me the Webster's Dictionary. Holiness is defined as that which is in the present, by the presence of God. The holiness is defined by what's going on in the holies of holies. Holiness is defined scripturally by that which is going on in the throne room. It's what the seraphim sing in Isaiah chapter 6 when they cry, holy, holy, holy. It's that place that everything that the temple and the tabernacle on, on the earth represented when it was so sacred and so set apart that nobody could come in there except for one man that was anointed once a year. It just so sacred and the spirit of sacredness has come to teach us how to live a sacred life it's going to teach us what did he do Jesus came and found you and me hiding in a bush naked and ashamed and he grabbed the hold of us and he gave us a big embrace and a kiss and he cleaned us up and he washed us up and he put a royal garment of, of, of fine white linen upon us, giving to us his own righteousness. He gave to us a crown of loving kindness and tender mercies. <laughs> An amazing God who's come and caused his glory to clothe us with his majesty and glory. That really defines things differently. I mean, Jesus, come on, Jesus said, seven, what did Jesus say? In John chapter 17, verse 22, he said, Father, the glory you gave to me, I've given it to them. Now go define the glory that Father gave to Jesus. Huh? When he talks about it, the glory that the Father gave to him, first of all, we, we beheld in him the glory of the only begotten Son of God. Then he went and made us sons of God. Huh? That's what, is that what the scripture says? As many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. As many as believe, He gave power and authority to be sons of God. That's John 1, 12. How many verses of scripture did I quote? 1 John 3, 1. Uh, you know, what else did I quote? Romans 8, 17. 
You know, it's, it becomes very different. Your life becomes very different when you let the Word of God abide in you. Huh? When you, when you begin to think like the Word of God says. Huh? Speak the powerful, authoritative Word of God. Huh? Believe what God says about you instead of what your teacher said about you. Or maybe what even your parents said about you. Or what anybody else, significant other or enemy or bully said about you. Huh? Come on now. Amen. Come on. Because I'm telling you, the word begins to go forth. And as it's preached, the Holy Spirit works in the lives of all the hearers so that he might produce faith. So that he might bring the action of faith. People begin to hear and the Holy Ghost is moving on their hearts. And they, became, they begin to believe. They begin to believe this is true. And as God, the Holy Spirit, sees that response where you begin to believe that it is true, suddenly there is a work of grace where faith begins to fill your heart. Faith is superior to belief. I know about the etymology studies of words. But I'm telling you right now, the devils believe. So that puts belief in a classification that's sub subordinate to faith. The devils believe in the scripture, just what James says. The devils believe and they tremble. It doesn't, the devils don't move in faith. Faith is something that comes as a result of relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus himself defines faith. He's the living word. He's the eternal word. If you don't believe that Jesus Christ is the word of God, I want you to start believing right now. He's the word incarnate. He is the eternal word of God made flesh. He is the logos. He is the definition of God, the declaration of God, the revelation of God, the expression of God. It is impossible to understand or see or know the Father unless you know him. That's what he told Philip. <laughs> That's what he said. I'm interested in what he said. Um, I love John Wesley, but he doesn't have a verse of Scripture in the Bible. Uh, Martin Luther, fine, but he doesn't have a verse of Scripture in the Bible. Augustine, fine, but he doesn't have a verse of Scripture in the Bible. Origen doesn't have a verse of Scripture in the Bible. I'm going with what Jesus said. I'm going to go with what Paul said because God gave him the authority to write out the autograph. And that's what we call the original text from which our Bible comes. Somebody said, how do we know we've got the right Bible? we got the right one. God's watched over it and miraculously watched over it to perform it. I don't see any of the, I don't see any of the scholars sitting around school going, how do we know we got the right Homer's Iliad? <laughs> huh? And they might doing that. No, because the devil's not in that. He's not questioning and reproaching God. <laughs> but when the analysis are done on extant manuscripts, whether it's Homer's Iliad or whether it's the Bible, the Bible stands up and, and, and shines with such amazing governance and guidance over it where that 99% of the extant manuscripts all agree on all the major points. And then the, if you start trying to think about some little minor points that don't have any value, then it maybe reduces to 94%. Homer's Iliad, at best, 74%. Huh? I mean, we can come at this from any direction you want to. I'm telling you right now. If science had enough time, they would come to prove in a pursuit of knowledge that God does indeed exist and He created everything with the breath of His nostrils. We just don't have that much time. And you don't. It's running out for you. The clock is ticking. The hourglass of time is diminishing every hour for you. God in His love has come to bring proofs. I know what grace... What mercy he has provided in those proofs with mighty signs and wonders and miracles and demonstration of the Holy Ghost. Yes. Jesus, I was, I was in Tokyo the other day and, you know, and some of you have already heard this. And I was just saying, Lord, how, or how can it be that Japan is such an unreached people group? How can it be that the church is so small that, you, that there's been very little headway and advancement of the kingdom of God in this nation? I was agonizing all over it. And the Lord spoke to me early in the morning and, and the Lord Jesus spoke to me right out of the scripture as he does and says, <laughs> because I mean, when Jesus talks, he preaches the word. It's one thing I've discovered about him. The men of God that I used to be around, when they gave words of knowledge, I always gave the verses of scripture from the Bible as it, applied, as it was applied to our lives. And, you know, as you heard me say the other day, yeah, of course, they gave sometimes telephone numbers. They gave information that no one would know except for God but that you know it always the scripture always leads the way the spirit of the Lord says to me the Lord Jesus spoke to me and said all authorities given me in heaven and earth 
I'm just looking for somebody to agree with me. Well, what if we just believe that Jesus got all authority in heaven? Because we can't really conceptualize how he have all authority on earth. And well, what will his authority result in in your life? Sickness and disease will go. Sin and oppression will go. Somebody said, well, how do you know that? Because that's what he said. Yes. That's what he did. He went preaching the gospel of the king. He said, the Holy Ghost is upon me because, God, because I've been anointed to preach the gospel to the poor, to bind up the broken in heart. I know what he does to the broken heart. He binds them up. That's the ministry of Jesus. You want another ministry? You want the ministry of Jesus. If you're going to have another ministry than the ministry of Jesus, then you have to define it outside of that which Jesus Christ did and said and taught and then clearly said to his 12 apostles that he appointed to go into the harvest, go cast out devils, cleanse the diseased, heal the lepers, freely you receive, raise the dead, you know, tell the crippled to walk, command them, c command the deaf to hear. Then the 70 others also. And then extends it to you and me today and says, anyone who believes, anyone who believes on me, these works which I do, shall they do also in greater works. What's go what do you need to do to convince you that that scripture is not true? Some people, all they need to do is this, just, <laughs> to have, it, to be convinced that that is scripture isn't true, is to just have one thing go against their effort in seeing that happen within their life. They lay hands on somebody, in other words, and they don't get healed or they uh, seemingly attempt to cast out a devil. It doesn't look like the devil goes. Suddenly, now they've got to say that verse of Scripture um, doesn't, isn't true or and then start making up various different ideas to invalidate it. Say, well, that was only for the first century church. Well, the Lord warned you. He said, don't add to the Scripture. He said, if you add to the Scripture, the plagues of this book will be added to you. And if you take away from the Scripture, you may be taken out of the, the book of life. Now, that is really hard for those people who believe that once you're saved, you're always saved. When Jesus said, your name is going to be taken out of the book of life. Now, he said it. Now, he said it. He said it. Uh -huh. Are you listening to me? I know. I just I pick on everything. Somebody says, well, what do you mean? What do you mean? What are you telling us? I'm just telling you, look, forget about all these ideas. Come walk with Jesus. Come lay hold on the ministry and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He found you in your sin and shame and sickness and disease. He brought you into his family. He gave to you his glory. He said, Father, make them one just like we're one. Father, just like you're in me, I'll be in them. So that they may be made perfect in one. Then people want to forget about that and go talk about the Trinity. You know nothing about the Trinity. Huh? You know nothing. I know nothing. Except for what? A little bit God's revealed in the Scripture. That's all we know. And then we want to argue with one another about it. Instead of stepping into divine glory, get broken, transformed, and baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire, and then go do the proofs that, uh, that you've been born of God. You know what Paul said? He said to those that were puffed up and telling all these various different stories in the church, I'm quoting out of 1 Corinthians chapter 4 about verse 19 right now, because I'm going to come to you guys. I heard about you all being puffed up, talking all this nonsense, telling another gospel than the one I preached. He said, I'm going to come to you. I'm going to prove who you are. He said, I'm going to see your power. I'm not interested in your words. That's what he said. You go look it up, 1 Corinthians 4, 19, okay? <laughs> he says, because verse 20, the kingdom of God is not in word but power. That's what, that's what Paul said. He said it over and over and over again. That's what he said. Look it up. Take time. Take time. And besides that, this is going on YouTube. I believe... <laughs> I believe in peer review. Jesus did nothing in secret. It was all wide open for everybody to be able to examine and evaluate. And I published my email address. You can write me, email me at any time. You can question me. You can examine me. You can, you can look into my life and, and demand proofs for this hope that I have in me. And I'm, I'm by the commandment of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm happily going to be able... Uh, by the Holy Ghost to give you those proofs. Amen. 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 This is true. What is it that the Lord's saying to us? Well, he's got, he's got a glorious church. He's got, a, he's got a, a ministry of life and truth 
He's got, a, he's got a glorious demonstration of, the, of his love to be manifested through our lives. It's, praise God for worship and song. There's nothing so wonderful to me as really worshiping the Lord in spirit and truth. It's one, of the, it's one of the reasons that we've been born of God so that we can do such a thing. It's glorious. But it doesn't stop there. When we begin to look at the church, look at how wonderful it functions and operates when you read verses of Scripture like 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 11 says, the manifestation of the Holy Ghost is given to every person so that they may profit. To one is given the word of knowledge, to another the word of wisdom, to another discerning of spirits. I, I like to group them in the order of revelation, power gifts, and, and vocal gifts. So it won't be in this order, but they'll all be there, okay? The word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, the discerning of spirits, the working of miracles. The gifts of healing, the gift of faith, powerful gift. Hallelujah. Hmm? Hallelujah. What a wonderful gift, eh? Jesus said, if you've got a little bit of faith, nothing will be impossible for you. You'll say to this mountain, be removed and cast in the sea. Whatsoever you say will come to pass. It will happen. So he said, well, what, what, what do I got to do for that to become a living reality? You got to find yourself hidden away in Christ Jesus. You got to let Jesus, you got to be willing to, have, to abide in Him and let His Word abide in you. You got to be willing to come into a relationship with the one who is faith. You, you got to understand when the centurion, the Roman centurion, encountered Jesus, Jesus defined for us for the first time in all of, since the day of creation, what faith was. In John, and forgive me, Matthew chapter 8, verse 10. And it was defined as the centurion said, I'm not worthy for you to come into my, my house. He was in awe of who Jesus was. He said, speak the word only, and I know my servant would be healed. Another, in Luke, it says, it says, he not counting himself worthy to go to Jesus, sent a servant unto Jesus to be an intermediary on his behalf. Saying, I'm not worthy to come to you, or nor I'm not worthy for you to come to my house. Speak the word only, and I know my servant will be made whole. Jesus said, this is faith. People want to define faith as the principles of belief, the ideologies, the philosophies. That's not faith. Jesus Christ is faith. Be, what do you feel about him? What do you believe about him? In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 28, two blind men came to Jesus, and they said... Jesus, that we, we want to receive our sight. Jesus looks at him and says this. Do you believe that I am able to do this? He's a source of faith. They said, yes, Lord. Immediately they were healed. When the woman with the issue of blood touched Jesus, someone said she touched the zizit. Yeah, well, she might have touched the zizit, which is a tassel that represents the covenant. But big deal. And the zizit had no power in itself. The zizit never did to her, for anyone what happened to her that day. She didn't touch the zizit. She touched faith. She touched Jesus. She didn't say within herself, if I could just but touch the zizit. <laughs> Give me a break. She didn't say that. She said within herself, if I could but just touch Jesus, the kingdom of this garment. If I could just but touch Jesus. If I, I don't need to touch him. I don't need to touch his head. I don't need to touch his hand. I don't need him to touch me. Let me just touch the lower part of his garment. Just anything, the closest thing to me that I could reach out. And I know I'll be made whole. <laughs> when Jesus looked at people said according to your faith it was people coming to him believing that he had the power to change them to heal them to meet whatever need that they had and so therefore he was able to say according to your faith faith in what? him he had the power he has the power today huh? Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth what happens when we begin to believe? you know I found over and again the people are willing to say, yes, Jesus Christ, your Lord. And, and yes, you know, no, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. But here's what things change. Things really change when you say, and you do what Jesus did. Who went everywhere preaching the gospel king, kingdom, commanding everyone to. Ooh. Is that what Jesus said? Is that what the Bible says? Ouch. Change. <laughs> responsibility, can't live like you're living anymore, getting up in your space, telling you what to do. Absolutely. <laughs> Repent. Repent. Change. 
Are you willing, are you willing to now turn your back on sin and turn your back on the world and come follow Jesus? Are you, are you willing to let God come to you in your shame and in your sin and bring you out of that place of misery and bring you into the light, glorious light of His presence and now teach you how to walk in all the splendor and beauty and majesty of His ways? Let me tell you about His ways. He's so full of love that He can love those who hate him and bless them who despitefully use him and say all manner of evil against him what a god huh he, he let me tell you about the his beauty of his ways he's so full of joy he's so full of peace that every day is absolutely a day filled with goodness and he wants to give that to you and me should you like to wake up every day and for the rest of your life live in goodness? Yes. Amen. Somebody said, how is it going? It's goodness. <laughs> it's, it's one of the fruits of the Spirit named in Galatians chapter 5. Goodness. Huh? The psalmist said, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord. Somebody said, well, that's not my experience. Sorry, God wants to make it your experience. Well, what do I got to do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved and your house. And then having been saved, having been born again, having, been, having received a new birth, having been given a new heart and a new spirit, now you can be led in the ways of righteousness. You can follow the Holy Spirit as He teaches us and guides us and trains us how to do everything that pleases the Father. You've got to come in the school of the Spirit. And that means you're going to have to deny worldly lust. And that means you're going to have to say no to hate and sorrow and sadness and all that other mess. You're going to have to make a choice to say, God, I want you. I come to you for sanctuary. I want your ways. I want to live in your heaven. Huh? I want to live in the things that belong to life and godliness. And I want to receive every good and perfect gift that comes from you. Why is that so hard? Why is that so hard? Why is it so hard? Somebody said, I can't believe these Christians telling us we can't drink alcohol. You know, Christians, they've always been sorrowful and miserable. <laughs> All miserable. And they're so miserable because they don't want to do anything that is fun. <laughs> and what doctrine is that? What joy unspeakable have they been experiencing? What joy in His presence have they been experiencing? Huh? I mean, my goodness. Don't be drunk with wine. That's what Paul said. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. The problem is they're not filled with the Holy Ghost. They are miserable. They need some alcohol. Because they stink and bumped out of the mind. They in sin and shame. Hide behind a bush and tear. Separated from God. Just to make myself perfectly clear. <laughs> Let me read a passage of scripture to you here, okay, in Isaiah chapter 55. Somebody said, oh, he's quoting the Old Testament. It's huh. all Jesus did. He said, lo, the volume of the book is written of me. <laughs> lo, the whole volume, the whole, the whole full, uh, every word of there. <laughs> he opened up their eyes that they may understand the scriptures which, are, which testified of him. Okay? And from Genesis chapter 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth to Revelation 22, 21. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen? Amen. It is all about Jesus. You got that? Should I repeat that? Should I do it for you in Greek? I'll do it for you in Greek if that'll help. How about Hebrew? Will that help? I mean, come on, people. It's just for, for at some point in time, we're just going to have to believe God's word. Let it be settled forever. It's, his word is forever settled in heaven. He settled it. It's settled with him. He's not going to add to it and take from it. It's not going to change. If you and I will believe it, we will ultimately grow and mature into receiving the benefit of everything that he's promised. Because he, there's one thing about this. The promise is certain. I don't know about the process, but the promise is certain. 
God can use whatever process he wants. The promise, the end result, certain. Are you listening to me? Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. <laughs> but, 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 but what happens if, you, if your faith starts wavering? What happens if you get over into doubt and unbelief? What happens if you get over and you start murmuring and becoming unthankful? What happens? You invalidate your walk with God. I'm telling you, you listen to me. There are spiritual laws as much as there are natural laws. That's why you and I need to become, be students of the Holy Ghost, come into the school of the Spirit so we can learn. I mean, you can look at Hebrews chapter 3 and Hebrews chapter 4. God just, the Lord said, look, I'm done. I'm, I'm done. He left the building. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. That's locked. Yeah, yeah, I'm done. He said, though it was finished from the foundation of the earth, I swear in my wrath, you should not enter into my wrath. Because if you're murmuring and complaining continually, you people all together giving over to unthankfulness. Well, we don't want that. I'm going to walk around praising him and worship him. I'm going to say, God, you are who you said you are. You're going to do what you said you'd do. I'm going to trust you. The basis of faith is trust. Paul gave his whole defense on faith, the doctrine of faith in Romans, based upon Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, which at best could be translated trust. Huh? Are you listening to me? Yes. Dear people, can you trust the Lord? Yes. Hallelujah. The Lord, the Holy Ghost will grow you up. He'll mature you. You know, when you're born of the Spirit, you know what you're like? You're like a little baby. The baby doesn't have much skills. The baby's totally dependent. It's like screaming and hollering, food! It's screaming and hollering for its toys. It's very selfish. Huh? Are you with me? But the Lord loves the babies. Paul talks about them in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, you guys walking around, you fighting and fussing with one another. One of you saying that you Baptists, the other is saying Pentecostals. He says, are you not carnal? Don't you live your life as mere men? Are you sitting arguing about things you don't even know? Are you listening to me? God wants us to grow up. He wants us to desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. That's what he wants. He wants us to grow and mature in the spirit. We're, new, we're, we're newborn. That's what, that's what the new birth is likened unto. Being born again, all over again, starting all over. Now to be developed and to be matured. Listen, people, it's, it's not a... It's not, I see hear so many people take verses of scripture and make them about a process of salvation. No, it's not about a process of salvation. It's not just about a... A preservation. It's about a maturation. That's what Paul said. And he's one who wrote most of those verses of Scripture that everybody wanted to talk about, how salvation is a process. Salvation isn't a process. Huh? You getting born wasn't a process. Well, I mean, you know what I mean. <laughs> a little pain and agony on your mom's part, you didn't even feel a thing. You, you came into this life. A fully developed human being. We born of the Spirit. Completely and totally. A new creation in Christ Jesus. It's beautiful, isn't it? We're a new creation. New creation. Isn't that beautiful? Old things. Behold, everything old has passed away. No, some things old. Don't change the Bible. Don't change the scripture on me now. Everything old has passed away. Behold, everything now is new. No, some things are new. No, everything is new. But how about that? And how about the other thing? No, just look here. Stop looking at your circumstances in the earthly realm. Look up in the heavens. See Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. Knowing the one that who began a good work and you shall also finish it. Understand that you've begun in the spirit to be finished by the spirit. Come on, look into Jesus now. Come on, quit looking at your circumstances. Understand what it is he said. He's made you a new creation in righteousness and true holiness. After his image and after his likeness. Isn't that radical? Yes. Somebody said, that, is that in the Bible? Yeah. First, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. He, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, for everybody who's taking notes. Two very important scriptures. Go ahead and put a third one there. Huh? Colossians 3.10. Okay? Hallelujah. He, he just changed us, you know? He's changed us. He's changed us into his image. He's changed us into his likeness. He's recreated us. He's made us new. He's made us everything that is acceptable, acceptable, holy and acceptable. 
Paul said, I beseech you by the mercies of Christ Jesus that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, not some challenge, not some great event of sanctification that take most of your life. How do you get holy and acceptable? Washed in the blood of the Lamb. The Spirit of the living God came upon me and changed me into new creation. Hallelujah. The Spirit of the living God came upon me and anointed me to be a son of God. Look, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Saul, anointed him to be king. This shy, tall guy suddenly had an authority that he struck fear in the hearts of men when he looked at them. Suddenly he was able to mobilize a whole nation that was divided and, 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 and lead them in a conquest against their, their enemy that seemed to be impossible to defeat. An anointing. An anointing that he gives to a priest to be able to stand in his presence and behold his glory. My. Huh? You have to have a special anointing to stand in the presence of God. Stand. Because, I mean, otherwise you're going to be flat on your face not being able to move. Hardly able to breathe. Unconscious. Huh? Look at Daniel. He, I mean, Daniel just had an angel visit him. He was wiped out. Huh? He fell down dead. Same for John in the New Testament. Fell down dead as a dead person. Huh? Whew. That's the only way to fall out under the power of God right there. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nah. It's become a fad to fall. Now, some of you say you got to fall forward. It's God. If you fall backwards, it's the devil. <laughs> fall sideways. I, I mean, I don't know. It's crazy. I mean, we're so mental. It's God help us. We're, we just need to get hungry, man. We need to get thirsty for God. The Holy Spirit wants to fill us with a deep longing, with longings which cannot be uttered. We, we, I know the King James Bible and some other Bibles translate that Greek word groanings. It's literally longings, deep desires, longings. The deepest longings known to men like thirst and hunger. And in that order, when you get thirsty, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. You're not tempted by nothing. You won't be tempted by nothing, I promise you. I promise you. Nothing matters. Just a drink of water. What do you have? I'll give anything for a sip. Hmm? Hungry, hungry is the second order. Oh, but when those deep longings become that which live on the inside of us because the grace of God has brought to us a thirsting and a hungering for Him. Oh, He comes to fill us. Look, everything that He has is given to us freely, but none of it's cheap. Everything that, he, everything that belongs to Him that is so sacred, He's come to pour out upon us, but it's still just as holy as it always has been. Huh? It is. And Father holds people accountable for what they do with holy things. Let me read this passage of Scripture to you. I'm going to try to find a place to close. Anybody here sick and diseased in their body? Huh? What's wrong? Hmm? Oh, it's okay. We're going to pray for you in just a minute. Huh? You got autoimmune disease? I got the cure. I have the cure. I had the cure for all orphan diseases. I had the cure for all orphan diseases. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ha 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 ha. Hallelujah. What a privilege. What a blessing to have the cure. I have to spend my life in a laboratory. Hallelujah. <laughs> Trying to discover some new thing about subpopulation T cells. I got the cure. Hallelujah. Christ Jesus came on the scene. Hallelujah. Praise God. I got the cure, and the beautiful thing of it is, is the Lord wants to take your case. I remember hearing Jack Cole said, if Jesus Christ takes your case, it is certain to be solved. <laughs> if Dr. Christ Jesus takes your case, you will be instantly and totally cured. <laughs> Amen. Now, let me just tell you something. Let me just say this to you in, in saying that. You know, we, we've watched over and again and been taught by those who've advanced things in the realms of, of healing and, and gifts of healing and working of miracles, especially when you try and do it in Nazareth. <laughs> Jesus couldn't get behind anything done in Nazareth. In fact, he didn't do anything in Nazareth because of unbelief. 
And when you get into a religious realm and when Satan has been able to gain an upper hand, a stronghold of religion, it takes some fire and some time, some preaching of the Word of God to bust up all that doubt and unbelief. That's the beautiful thing about the Word of God. It's like a hammer, sledgehammer too. <laughs> Hallelujah. Bust up the rocks of unbelief and doubt. Praise God. That's why we spend a lot of time preaching. Huh? It's like a fire. That burns up the chaff. What is chaff? It's the lies and the, and, 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 the, and the words of false prophets teaching things that God did not say. Somebody said, how can I know that what you're saying is what God says? Right here, you can read the book. Like never before, the Lord has given to us such a privilege. I mean, I mean, goodness, there's, what translation would you like? I mean, what vernacular would you like to hear it in? I mean, you've got computer programs that can analyze each word down to the original basis all the way back to ancient Eucharist. And Hittite in between. And then examine and cross-reference it with Phoenician definitions. <laughs> My, we've never before has such a resource been made available to man to be able to hear plainly what the Word of God has to say. You, you don't have to be like the, the guys a hundred years ago to really begin to pull the verses of Scripture together. You memorized the whole Bible and you labored in it hours, day in, day out. Now all you do is like type the word into your search engine and hit return. There it is. It's all lined up for you. You click, point and click, and you can go to the context and make sure that you're not violating the context. And still, still somehow, that word, that creative word of God that produces faith in the, those who hear, somehow doesn't take root in our lives. The Lord tells us why. He tells us why. Cares of this life, deceitfulness of riches, pleasures of this world. But listen, I want to come back to this. You know, when you look at history, you look at revivals that took place here in the United States of America and the whole of the Western world. Those meetings sometimes went 12, 14, 16, 20 weeks. And then the miracles started happen, happening. People would sit in the meetings. They weren't, they'd keep coming back. They'd sit in the meetings. The meetings go on three times a day. Can you imagine that? Three times a day for a long extended period of time. Oh, we, go, we just kind of like, we think about the Cane Ridge revival. We think about all these great revivals. Man, the revivals that were especially up there in the Appalachian Mountains, those are coal miners, man. And they stayed in the meetings till after midnight and got up at 4 o'clock in the morning and went to work. They were running on some kind of divine strength. Those things changed our culture. It changed the United States of America. It brought the wind of awakening across this nation. Now we're all upset and tired if the preacher goes 30 minutes over. <laughs> the allotted time. And we don't know who set the rule of allotted time. It's kind of like a generous, general consensus in the atmosphere. It's like just before breakthrough, shut up. <laughs> Help us, Lord Jesus. <laughs> I'm telling you that faith grows. Faith grows in the preacher. I mean, I just preached 26, 26 different meetings in Japan. I just came back from Japan. 26 different meetings in Japan. I watch faith grow in me as I'm preaching. I mean, unfortunately, it was in different places, Tokyo, Osaka, Okinawa. But I'm, you, God's people, you press in. When you, really, when you really believe that what God says is true and that what he has promised is yours, you know what? You're not going to let go. You're going to be like the widow. Huh? What if we had a generation of widows who, by their continuous coming to the judge, got whatever they asked? Huh? This is why men ought to pray, not to faint. I got so many things to say tonight, I won't be able to get them all set. Somebody said, every time you preach, you preach 10 or 12 different sermons. No, I don't. No, I don't. I don't really. It's one sermon. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's one big, gigantic message. All of it's relevant. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Isaiah 55. There's a verse of scripture I want you to, I want you to focus on here. And um, in Isaiah chapter 55... It's verse 5. And I want you to understand verse 5 in the view of the glory of God being upon in the midst of the church, upon his people. 
The majesty of God. Now, I want you to define the glory of God being upon His people in the midst of His church by the glory of God being upon Jesus Christ in the midst of His ministry. Okay? I want, you to, I want you to look at church. I want you to look at church differently. I want you to define church as being in a Jesus meeting when everybody's come from every, all the region roundabout and everybody gets cured and everybody gets healed. John chapter 6, everybody. John, look, it, he cures them of all of their diseases, everything. A, a, a Matthew 4, 28, a Matthew 9, 35, every one of their diseases, every one of their sicknesses. They've been there for three days, captivated by the anointing, 72 hours. Wow, what a meeting. And now he says, I don't want to send them away hungry. Give them to eat. We don't have anything. The little boy comes and says, I got something. A few loaves and a few fishes. He takes a few loaves and a few fishes, divides it, and now feeds 5,000 men, not counting women and children. And I'm telling you, they were very, they were very, um, they're like very big families back in those days. Think about it. The whole family was there. And then that's just the revival, really. The revival meeting is just getting started. That's what revival means to me. I'm not defining revival. I mean, we can have press in meetings, wanting to have revival meetings, but that's a revival meeting. And then it would have continued on going, but men got their hands in it, started trying to manipulate it, and would come and take him and make him king by force. That's what the scripture says. And him, he knowing that they would make him, try to come take him and make him king by force, departed. Sent away the disciples and departed it into a solitary place. Isn't that radical? We're always doing that kind of stuff. As soon as God starts moving, oh, we need to build, build a church. Mount, Mount Transfiguration, what we call a Mount Transfiguration, it's really just Jesus' prayer meeting. Right? Jesus' prayer meeting that he allowed the apostles, the three of the apostles to come and witness when he starts talking to Papa. His clothes start bright, shining with the brightness of eternal glory. His face lights up like the sun. Elijah and Moses are standing there encouraging him. Huh? And Father speaks audibly from heaven. Come on, what a prayer meeting, man. Come on, please, please, please. I, I, I want you to take that concept of the ministry and the purpose and the glory upon Jesus. I want you to make that what Isaiah 55, 5 is. Isaiah 55, 5. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not. And nations that... You, or in other words, you shall, you shall name the nations, okay? You shall call them. And Jesus said, all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Go and make disciples of all nations. That's what he said. And we got some work to do, folks, right here, because somehow we lost the attention of this nation, the United States of America. It needs to be uh, rededicated and consecrated to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, much more the unreached people groups. Are you with me? Yes. He says, then well, look at what's going to happen. And nations that knew you not shall run to you. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because of what? Because why? Huh? Because of the Lord your God, because the Holy One of Israel, He hath glorified thee. Jesus said the same glory the Father gave to me. I've given it to you. I'm going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and power. I'm going to send the promise of the Father upon you. Not many days from now, go wait until you receive power from on high, until you endued, until you clothe with the majesty. Now, let's look at some of the things that's standing in the way. Just start at the first verse in this context. I'm not going to be long. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsts, come to me. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsts, come to the waters. I said to me, because I want to say this, Paul said that Jesus Christ was the rock in the wilderness. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he said so. He said they all drank of the same spiritual rock. Are you with me? What came out of the rock? Water. Jesus represented the water as the Holy Ghost. Are you with me? He told Moses, all I got to do is speak to the rock. Today, all we, the rock has been smitten, was smitten at Calvary. Right now, we speak to the rock, Christ Jesus, and Paul says, we drink of that spiritual water. Are you going to speak to the rock? You ask Christ Jesus to, to drink. He says, come drink. He said, anybody thirsty, come drink. I'll give it to you to drink, and out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. He makes us a part of his ministry in every way. That which he could supply to the nations, he's made it to where that you and I could supply the same things to the nations. Are, is, are there going to be challenges, dear people? Yeah. Are there going to be a lot of... Opposition and interference. That Satan's going to try to run against us. Yeah, he is. That's why Paul said, "Be strong in the strength of the Lord and power of His might." If he's in chapter six, verse ten, understand. 
I, I function a bit in the word of knowledge when I'm preaching. Not only prophecy. And just let people know what God's telling them. Okay? And really, you're just going to have to bear with me if you think my sermons are too long or if I don't stay on topic. He just simply says, Ephesians chapter 6, 10, he said, be strong and strength of the Lord and the power of his might. I mean, that, that is like God in giving us, he's empowering us. He's not controlling us. He's not demanding us to do something out of our own ability and strength. He's giving us the, he's giving us the privilege. He said, I'm, I'm going to give this to you. When he says glorify, when Paul says glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are his, is that a task that you get to do? No. It's a privilege. It's an opportunity. You've been given the right now. God, Father says, I'm going to give you the ability to do this. But will you do it? You've got to lay hold of a lot of things because I'm going to tell you right now, uh, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord still delivers us out of all of them. In this world, we will have tribulation, but we can be, you know, we can have great joy because he's overcome the world. The bottom line of it is, is there's a contest. Understand the spirit, spiritual wickedness. Understand Satan with all of his tricks comes out against us to stop us. He goes about as a roaring lion seeking to be made devour. We're supposed to stand against all of the wiles or tricks of the devil. Because we're engaged in a wrestling match, as it were, against spiritual wickedness. <laughs> you know, they, they can't do anything about Jesus, what Jesus did at Calvary 2,000 years ago. He can't. He was absolutely defeated. He was kicked out of heaven. He has no rights, rights or access to the realms of glory as it was in the days of Job or as it was in the days of Daniel. He has no rights nor access at, at all. Listen to me. But he don't believe a word of it because he's deceived and he's a deceiver and he's a liar. He doesn't believe he's defeated. He's going to try two more times to overthrow God. Huh? Try to tell the devil that he's defeated. <laughs> He's going to kick and scream and holler. Jesus stands in front of a man who is demon-possessed, who had legion, and commanded the devil to go. And the devil said, I adjure you, the, my, the most high God, leave me alone. What do you think he's going to say to you? You're going to have to come right back at him with divine power and authority. You've got to have a confidence and a boldness of who you are in Christ Jesus. I believe confidence and boldness and assurance are also fruits of the Spirit. I named 26 fruits of the Spirit in the Bible, not just nine. Forgiveness and mercy is also fruits of the Spirit. But look, you're going to have to come into the school of the Spirit so you can be confident. You know, it's really, it's not, it's not looking in, at ourselves. If we look at ourselves and we think about, well, what skills do I have? What ability do I have? And you faced with someone who just got out of the mental ward or who's crawling around screaming, biting, gnawing on people and whatnot, huh? Ah! You're going to go, my goodness, I'm about to give that person some help. You know, is there a tranquilizer in the house? But when you know it's not you, it's Jesus. All you do is declare the word. Jesus makes you whole. And that's true. Jesus makes you whole. Jesus is the Savior. He's your Lord right now. I set you free. Paul received the same message, really, and had the same message that Jesus had. He said God had anointed him with the ability to turn men from the power of Satan to the power of God. That's a whole new way of preaching the gospel, to turn them from darkness to light, to open up their eyes spiritually so they'd be no longer blind. That's what he said in his defense to the king Agrippa. In Acts 26, verse 19 and 20. It's what he said. I'm going with that. That's what Je that's the ministry of Jesus transferred over to the ministry and seen in the, in the life of Paul. Come on, it's your ministry too. Now you're going to have to grow and mature in these things. That's why apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers are given. So that you can come into the fullness of the measure of the maturity, the ministry of Jesus, even unto a fully matured man so that you would no longer be like children tossed to and fro by every trick of Satan. Ephesians 4, 13 and 14. You got one or two choices. A, fully mature in the ministry of Jesus. Or B, stay a kid and get beat up constantly and tricked. Huh? And run over top of and disappointed. Who wants that? Say, I'm done with that. Come on, man. Come on, man. I'm done with that. Huh? But you're going to have to let some pastor get up in your space and start correcting you and rebuking you and telling you you're wrong. When he sees by the Spirit of God that you're not doing what you're supposed to do. Now in the United States of America where everybody bleeds red, white, and blue, how are you going to be able to do that? Huh? How are you going to be able to do that? Kingdom mentality is a, for some, is a forgotten concept. Are you listening to me? We in a democracy. No, 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 no. No, no we're not. We're in the kingdom. We're in the kingdom. And the kingdom is not a divine dictatorship. And the kingdom is not some concept of theocracy. Jesus said, if you love me, you obey me. 
It's ruled by relationship. Isn't that beautiful? Can you imagine being in the government of God all the rest of your life? And the order of rulership is relationship. And you do whatever it is that you do. You obey and you walk the way God wants you to walk because it's all about love. Wow. I think that's the most wonderful thing that has ever been thought of. And God thought of it. So no wonder. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Be strong in the strength of the Lord and power of his might. My God, David, how can you do that? How, with all of these torments and all of these fears and all these stresses and all these things that's come out against us and all these giants that live in the land, we like little grasshoppers. Huh? There's two guys. One who stood around and watched the glory of God for 40 years wouldn't depart from the temple. And Caleb, who is infectious with the same love and determination, says, oh, we will able to live this life. We have this confidence. Everybody wants to be Joshua and Caleb. I'm afraid that there's, there's probably still only two. I hope there's more. I mean, come on, because really, if we grab a hold of the same vision and faith and determination and confidence in who God is, we're going to go everywhere doing the works of Jesus, having the ministry of Jesus revealed in our lives. The glory of God will be seen upon us. I mean, think about what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. They come into your meetings and everybody's prophesying and the secrets of their heart are made manifest and they fall down in the place saying, truly God's here. Wow, what a glorious realm, man. Come on. Everybody who comes on the property gets healed. Hindus don't run interference with faith. That's why we see so many miracles in Nepal and in Hindu nations. They're just there. So you say, this God, Jesus Christ, is here and he's going to heal me? Okay. How many of you want to be saved? Did you see the video that Elizabeth put up? How many of you would like to give your life to Jesus? It's a mass movement of over 2,000 people. That was everybody that was there. Everybody, they come running. And then the power of God falls. And the mentally insane, the demon possessed, they're delivered. Just the devils are cast out. I mean... You get in America and everybody knows God. I mean, ask the statistics. 80% of the people know God and they're going to heaven. Come on. Religion, we've been baptized in religion. And we're certain that we're right. And then the pride of life gets mixed with that. And now it's just one gigantic resisting the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Hindus have no ability to resist the Holy Ghost. Muslims have no ability to resist the Holy Ghost. That's why such miracles take place. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's going to be that way here in America. You know why? I've said, Lord, you said greater works. You yes. said greater works. Amen. So then let us do yes. mighty works in Nazareth. Yes. To do mighty works in Nazareth is greater works. Yes. Are you with me? Yes. Everybody yes. understand that? Amen. To do mighty, amen. amen. What does it take for people to be humbled and be hungry for God? Hell, everyone at thirst, come to the water. That's what the Lord says. He says, every one of you, and, and come, he that has no money, come, buy and eat. Hey, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. He says, why do you spend your money for that which will not profit, which is not bread, and, and your labors for that which satisfies not? Hearken diligent unto me. And eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me. Hear, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and a commander to the people. Verse 6, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Verse 7, let the wicked forsake his ways. Let the unrighteous man his thoughts let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Jesus looks at you and me today, even as he did then in, in John chapter 7, and he says, is anybody really thirsty? Because they were going through a religious ritual. It's the Feast of Tabernacles. It was an emotional event back in those days. Historians like Josephus, historians like Philo, all testify to those events. They would take palms, ranches, and they would strike the earth and call 
for the mysterious Ruach to come forth from the earth. Mysterious spirit of the Lord. They didn't understand what they were doing. They would go draw water from the pool of Siloam and take it up to the altar to pour it out upon the altar. In the midst of this Feast of Tabernacles where this ritual is going on and they're screaming and crying out, with water should we draw, with joy should we draw water from the wells of salvation, Isaiah chapter 12. Jesus stands up and says, and of course, you know, if you read it in Nehemiah chapter 10, you can discover the demand that God has for a great display of joy and rejoicing within it, okay? Because the Feast of Tabernacles had not been celebrated for a long time until that revival that you read about in Nehemiah chapter 10, Jesus stands up in the midst of all this joy and all this display, all this mystical uh, religious activity going on where they're calling for the water of the Spirit to come forth from the earth. They don't know what they're saying, right? It sounds weird too, doesn't it? Did you know that water's coming forth from the earth right now, these earthen vessels? Did you know? Jesus cries out and says, hey, if you're really thirsty, come to me. I'll give you to drink, and out of your earth and vessel, out of your belly, out of your kalia, Greek word, which was actually used in Attic Greek to describe emotions and passions. He didn't say heart. He didn't say other words that are used with a spiritual connotation. He used a very unique word that's never, ever used again in the, in, in the New Testament Greek. And it has a unique meaning. And so he's saying, out of your passions, out of your emotion, shall flow rivers of living water. This spake ye of the Holy Ghost, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, for he was not yet glorified. That's John chapter 7, 38, 39. I know it's a mystery to some people. Some folks have never heard it. But look, Peter standing up in Acts chapter 2 and verse 33 saying, And Jesus now being exalted at the right hand of the Father has poured forth that which you see in here. And it was coming out of their bellies. He looks at you and me right now and he says, come and drink. Are you thirsty? Are you really thirsty? Are you really thirsty? Are you thirsty for God? Then what I'm, here's what I'm going to do. Are you hungry? I've got a promise for you. Suddenly, if our hearts are turned and we begin to say, Lord, I want the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. I want your divine empowerment in my life. We can recognize something that is far beyond the religious activities that we've ever had in our life. The witnesses that we've ever had in our life. We can be clothed with the divine presence of God that gives us supernatural confidence and boldness. So we don't have to have it in ourselves or have it in the concepts of what we believe, but God actually gives it to us. It's tangible. Hmm? It's amazing. It's amazing how the God would come upon our lives with a rushing mighty, a sound of a rushing mighty wind clothed in tongues of fire. Now this is where people start falling apart on me because now we're not going to be esoteric anymore. We're not going to be existentialist anymore. It's not going to be some mystery, hidden mystery. Now it's all going to suddenly be tangible, living God face to face that we have to give an account with to and that we can have a relationship right now with. That changes everything. <laughs> that changes everything. To have your eyes open to be able to see. Jesus crying, calling out to you. Are you thirsty? Come drink. What's going to happen when you drink? Rivers of the Holy Ghost are going to flow out of you. What happens when the rivers of the Holy Ghost flow out? I'm telling you, you can be strong in the strength of the Lord and the power of His might. I'm telling you, everybody who's sick and diseased is going to be healed. Thank you, Jesus. But Jesus didn't have to have 12, 16, 18, 20 weeks of meeting. Three, he could get it done in a day. We're pressing in to see God do this wonderful work to where nations come running to us. Where everybody gets saved, everybody gets healed, everybody gets delivered, everybody has an encounter with God. I want you to stand with me. Hallelujah. Everybody has the right to have an encounter with God. Hallelujah. <laughs> everybody has that right to have an encounter with God. 2.4 billion people who've never even heard about Jesus have the most right. They should have, you can't have two priorities at one. I, once I give them the priority A. 2.4 billion people have never even had an opportunity to hear about Jesus. We call them the unreached people groups. The 1040 window. I believe that it's probably the majority of 7 billion people that have never really truly had an encounter with God. 
And the only thing that's going to change that is that you and I are going to start crying out for God to baptize us in the Holy Ghost and fire. Send the fire now. Somebody said, oh, you can't say send the fire now. He's already sent the fire. Okay, well, fine. Let me see the results of the fire of God. Biblical results of the fire of God. Let me see it. Let me see whole county shut down and tremble under the shakening, shakening presence of the Holy Spirit under divine Holy Ghost conviction. Father Nash knew little about the moving of the Holy Ghost, but he went to praying. And when he prayed for Charles Finney, and, Charles, and he's in behind the closed doors praying for Charles Finney, and Charles Finney would walk into a county, the whole county would shut down under divine Holy Ghost conviction. Just want to see it again, that's all. Just want to see it again. I sat around the table listening to the preachers who preached in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s saying, saying in the 70s, what happened to Holy Ghost conviction in the church? What's going on? There's a spiritual rebellion in the climate change that's happened in our nation. What do we need to do to return back to that place of sensitivity to the Holy Ghost, fear of God, and reverence for His presence? I mean, I, I, mean, I, just grew, I grew up on this kind of, this kind of conversation around the Supper table. And of course, my dad was an evangelist and really still is. He's doing what he's doing now in the Philippines at 84 years of age. Um, you know, you had supper at 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> 12 o'clock at night because the meeting's over then. Well, I'm just telling you, dear, dear people, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, day, forever, the same promise. He's just got the same ministry. And one of the last things Jesus said, John, in Acts 1, 5, is one of the last things Jesus said. He said, John baptized you with water. You'll be baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire not many days from now. So just one of the last things Jesus said, Acts 1, 5. When, Paul, when Peter was making defense for Cornelius' house and why he went over there and hung out with those Gentiles, he said, wait a minute. God poured out the Holy Ghost to get to the Holy Ghost on them just like he did on us. He said, when I stood there watching it happening, I remember what the Lord Lord said. You should receive the Holy Ghost. John baptized with water, but you should be baptized with the Holy Ghost in fire. That's how he quoted it. Acts 11, what is it? Was it? Acts 11, is it 13, verse 13? Do you know the Bible? Do you believe the Word of God? Do you believe God is who He says He is? Yes. Did He do what He says He would do? Then go lay hands. Then go cast out devils. Amen. Speak with new tongues. If you drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt you. Take up serpents, it will not be able to harm you. Just like with Paul. He was making a fire. A serpent comes out, bites him, shook it off. <laughs> Felt no harm. I was telling Ruth Annie here on the way here, I said, we were in Osaka. And I'm just going at it. I'm in the room was kind of hot. Praying for people. And this guy from Burma, this pastor from Burma, comes, I'm praying for people. So it's coming. Comes up with this big, nasty handkerchief. Sticks in my face, starts wiping all the sweat off my face for me. <laughs> that thing smells so bad. <laughs> And the Burmese have a different definition of hygiene than I do. <laughs> I knew no deadly thing should be able to hurt me. <laughs> and then I didn't say anything because the blessed, the blessed dear man was wanting to serve me. And he caught me a second time with that same nasty <laughs> Dear Jesus. We just can go everywhere and we can tell people, we can say, come to the meeting. If you're blind, you'll see. If you're deaf, you'll hear. If you're crippled, you'll walk. Especially when we're, you know, in third world countries. But I don't let up here. You know the hardest thing that I deal with? Let me tell you the hardest thing I deal with. People coming and believing in their mind that it's the will of God for them to be sick, and yet they're still standing in the light prayer line to be healed. Well, wait a minute, we've got a contest going on here. How can faith work when you believe God's purpose for you to be healed. And by the way, if God's purpose for you to be healed, why are you going to the doctor and why are you taking medication? Because now that's rebellion. But I'm not going to go there. I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to leave it alone. I'm just going to leave it alone. 
Because I've hit too many topics already tonight. <laughs> All I'm doing here, people, is I'm preaching the Word of God. I'm tearing down so that we can build. I'm uprooting so that we can plant. I just want you to come participate with me. Jesus came, found you in shame, hiding from the presence of God, grabbed you, hugged you, kissed you, put a robe of righteousness upon you, crown of loving kindness and tender mercies upon your head, made you his very own. He absolutely overwhelmed you with his goodness and his glory. He has filled you with the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit stands alongside of you. Now you can do anything in his name. Go everywhere. And you have the authority to stand in his stead, declaring to the world to be reconciled unto God. Given power to bless them <laughs> with whatever they need. So we just want you to go do that. Amen. We want it to be in your body right now, in your life. We want you to take a hold of the power of God right now. Not tomorrow, now. All you have to do is be thirsty. Now, I know that, I know that what's going to happen is that you might have memories of past failures and experience. You can't let those things take you from and pull you out of Christ Jesus. You need to get yourself back right there and abiding in Him. You can't let failure of the past, you can't let disappointment of the past somehow uproot you from living the life in Christ Jesus. You can't let something displace His Word from dwelling in you. Now come on now. Jesus invites every one of us. He says, come, come into me. And I will give you rest. Take my servitude upon me. See, I'm a servant. He says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Okay, I'm a servant. What am I supposed to do? Whatever Father says. What does Father say? Go heal sick. Cast out devils. Lay hands on sick, they shall recover. That's what he tells me to do. Yes. Amen. Amen. He says, speak to the dead. Speak to them. As far as I know, no one's that I, I've never raised anyone from the dead, as far as I know. I mean, I've tried. Believe you me. I said, get up! <laughs> In Jesus' name! A friend of mine was, he comes here and he preaches for us, Tim Hall. He was in Papua New Guinea and he was declaring the word of the Lord. He said, this, he said, bring the blind, they'll see, the deaf to hear, crippled, they'll walk, the dead to be raised to life again. And so they brought down out of the mountains in the nation of Papua New Guinea a boy had been dead for three days, a stiff all over his body. They laid him up on the platform, the platform about six foot high. The boy got up on the platform and he came to life and ran across the platform. Yeah. Whole nation was changed. It was about 30 years ago. Whole nation was changed. That's how nations are changing. A little, a little slave girl from Cappadocia was taken as a slave into the nation of Georgia. Huh? God used her to change a whole nation. So how could that possibly be? One little slave girl, one little slave girl. Well, back in those days, if a child was sick, they would take it from door to door so that people could see the baby and maybe someone had familiarity with it and they could give a remedy, whatever the disease might be. They brought that little slave girl, Cappadocia. She answered the door, saw the baby, laid hands on the baby and said, in the name of Jesus, be made whole. And the baby was cured. The word got to the queen of Georgia who had been diseased and sick in her body for many years. They called for the slave girl to come. She laid her hands on her, prayed for her in the name of Jesus. The woman was instantly cured. And the king proclaimed Georgia as a nation in the second century A.D. True. That's how nations have changed. I remember hearing the story of two great men of God. T.L. Osborne and Benson Idahosa. Two of the greatest men of authority in the 20th century. Signs and wonders, docu miracles. We'll, be put, docu we'll put more docu miracles up on our website so people can see them. They were standing preaching the gospel... And uh, telling to people saying, you know, and these men were, are, are well-known men of great authority. I mean, so many people had been raised from the dead, blind eyes open, deaf ears unstopped, so many crippled people walking there, standing in this crusade meeting, and they're saying, the blind shall see that Jesus is Christ is the healer and the Savior. He's the same yesterday, today, forever. If you're blind, you'll see. If you're deaf, you hear. If you're crippled, you walk. If you're diseased, you'll be cured. If you're dead, you'll be raised to life again. This is the gospel. They said that first day. Nobody was healed. No one. <laughs> Not even a headache. Nothing. <laughs> Day two, they came out. Jesus Christ is a Savior, the healer. Same yesterday, today, and forever. If you're blind, you see. If you're deaf, you hear. If you're crippled, you walk. If you're diseased, you'll be cured. If you're dead, you'll be raised to life again. 
Second day, no miracles. Third day, no miracles. Same message, no miracles. Fifth day, no miracles. Same message, sixth day. Same message, seventh day. Same message, eighth day. These are brave men. These are a unique, valiant kind of people. Ninth day, same message, no miracles. Tenth day, same message, no miracles. These are, these are the top of the top who are not changing God's word and not closing down the meeting and going home and not backing down. Eleventh day, the greatest display of signs and wonders and miracles in both of their ministries took place. Sometimes you just got to stand, man. <laughs> Be strong in the strength of the Lord and the power of His might. Don't budge from the Word. Don't budge. Because the Lord has the right to test us and examine us. He has the right to prove us. Don't budge. Keep speaking to the mountain. Keep speaking to the mountain. I have a friend of mine who's watching right now, an evangelist, wonderful evangelist. And um, <laughs> he was in Mexico. and <laughs> There wasn't a whole lot of faith where he was at. and He didn't have a lot of time. He, and, and to see, you know, a breakthrough, just had a couple of days of ministry, and there was a deaf woman. He stuck both fingers in the ear, just like Jesus did. That's how Jesus ministered. The person was deaf and, and, and had an impediment in the speech. Jesus <laughs> stuck his fingers in the ears. Of course, my dear friend didn't spit and touch his tongue, but he stuck his fingers in his ears. <laughs> Jesus, I mean, great <laughs> you see Jesus <laughs> sticking, you know, fingers in the ears, spitting and sticking his finger in his tongue, or however it was he did it. <laughs> and he sticks his finger in the woman's ears. I command you in the name of Jesus. Here, now. It went on. It went on. Five minutes. Ten minutes. Now he's valiant. He's not, he's not backing down. He's in a fight and he's going to win. I said, here. Now the woman really doesn't even want him to touch him. She's still... He's still Jason her down, got his fingers in her ear. He's got his fingers in her ear. People are starting to dissipate from the crowd. Terrible thing for an evangelist. Because, you know, you got It's all about entertainment now, you know. It's all about keeping the flow going. He's not backing down. He's got a word from God. You're going to hear, woman. <laughs> now she's starting getting upset. Her husband's getting upset. He screams again. I said, here! I don't know how long it was. You have to remind me. 15, 20 minutes. It's valiant. It's valiant. Hey? Eh? It's valiant. She heard. All of a sudden, her hearing came. Huh? To be born deaf and now to hear? And she's an older person? I went into, I went into Nepal... And back in 2008, and I, this particular evangelist I was talking about, I sent in him in for a week to minister on faith. I went in and ministered in the daytime on faith to all these young people, about 300 young people from the different colleges, Presbyterian College, Simmons God College, Methodist College. And in the meetings, they were so radical. They would pull people out of wheelchairs and drag them around. And here's people totally paralyzed, you know, weak little timid legs flopping all over, getting skin up on the dirt. And, you know, when I first saw it, pastoral instincts started to kick in, I started to go, hey, guys, come on, man. I mean, you know, wait. But then there was preventing me. I just stood there. I stood there of a crowd of 30,000 plus people letting God do whatever it is he wants to do. I don't have to be entertaining nobody. When the power of God and the presence of God is there to rapture and captivate your soul, and you know God's there, and you don't have to be doing nothing, you're not the entertainer. Come on, man. Things got to change. I see a bunch of entertainers. And go to Hollywood, man. You missed your calling. <laughs> be an actor. We watch as these kids drug these people around, drug them around. Some drug around. I don't know. I lost track. I didn't even. I was lost track because other people were getting healed, getting delivered, signs and wonders. And then we would see as people that are being drug around, all of a sudden get up and take off running. Huh? And then all of a sudden there's a whole crowd up on the front, up in front of the platform. The platform is about six, seven feet high. Walking around. Who hadn't, who hadn't walked? Some with really teeny skinny legs. Little wobbly legs.
Do you see how elastic the little boy's legs were that I posted on my yeah. Facebook yesterday? Yeah. They were elastic. Could bend them. He would never walked in his life. The preacher said, in Jesus' name, stood him up. Strength came into his legs. In Jesus' name, walk. He started walking. Huh? Come on, man. You don't think you're going to face opposition to start moving in those kinds of signs and wonders? Satan says, ain't no way you're doing that, man. Ain't no way. I know who you are. I knew who your daddy was. I knew who your grandpa was all the way back to Adam. And you ain't doing it. That's the way it works. You have to have the name of Jesus and the authority of his word. And having done all to stand, stand. Ha, 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 ha. Hallelujah. Huh? This ain't about holding on till Jesus comes. This is about going everywhere, preaching the gospel, taking that word of God, that word of life, and setting the captives free. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom to every creature on the planet. The same way Jesus did it. He said, this gospel of the kingdom must be preached as a witness to all nations. Then the end shall come. Come on now. You know what I'm saying? Do you feel that? I feel that very strongly. I'm in America. Right now they say that we're going to take the new property on the corner of 15 and Carroll Canyon Road on December the 1st now. Amen. So. That's the plan. And we're just... We're just believing the Lord that it's just simply a resource to go and start gathering in the lost. Amen. Start throwing the net and bringing in all kinds of fishes. Both good and bad. Just processing them through. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm going to pray for every one of you. I went too long tonight, in some respects. I don't have much time to pray for you. I'm just going to come by and lay my hands on you. And uh, the power of God's going to come on you and touch you. If you're sick or diseased in your body, you're going to be healed in Jesus' name. <laughs> Hallelujah. True. 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 If you're discouraged and hurting, you're going to get encouraged and feel good. We're going to come by and bless you. <laughs> and a blessing never hurt. Amen. So I just want you to believe. I mean, you see, the thing about it is, it's not anything that I as a person has of my own innate ability. It's that gifting that God has given in the church. That's what he's done. So it's lay hands on people. Amen. Amen. Paul in Acts chapter 3, verse 4. Acts chapter 19, forgive me, verse 3 and 4. After having asked him if they'd received the Holy Ghost since they believed, they said they didn't know there was any Holy Ghost. He said, didn't you hear what John said? He said, I baptize with water and repentance. One comes after me, baptize with the Holy Ghost and fire. And after that, he laid hands upon them. Amen. Huh? He laid hands upon them. What happened to them? They got blessed. Hallelujah. Began to speak with heavenly languages. Step, what happened is they stepped out of the, they stepped off the pages of their life into the pages of the Bible. They stepped off, they stepped from an earthly realm to a heavenly realm. It's about a step away. In fact, you don't even have to take a step. You get translated there. <laughs> That's true. Colossians 1.13. You've been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of dear son. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Just let the Lord touch you right now. Right now in Jesus' name. 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 Be healed. Be healed. Be healed by our God. <laughs> Touch right now. Touch right now. Be healed in Jesus' mighty name. In the mighty name of Jesus. Right now, I command the affliction and torment go out of your body. 
autoimmune disease, I curse you and I command you to go. You afflicting, tormenting spirit of darkness. You leave this body alone. This trouble goes from you now. Now, colitis goes now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Right now, I speak health and life and strength to your body. In Jesus' name. Touched right now in Jesus' name. Fire God comes on you. I command you to be blessed right now. I command you to be blessed right now. Strengthen in Jesus' mighty name. Power of God comes on you right now in Jesus' name. Fire God right there. Power of God right now in the name of Jesus. Seiko token nakate. Sukarata. Este pato ya pando katai. Istan afra. Mokalista taranesha. Hallelujah. Drunk continually in the Holy Ghost all the time. Overwhelmed by the power of God. Filled. Filled. Touched by the power of God. Filled. Strengthened now in Jesus' name. Blessed. I bless you right now. Hallelujah. <laughs> now in Jesus' name. Now in G. I put the red blood of Jesus Christ upon you. I break every power of everything. Unlike Christ Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Be filled. Be filled. I command you to be filled. <laughs> Hallelujah. Urabadakata. Uribere de baladuchi de nada. Mile little batusta prata gishu balado prata haya. Blessed. Right now in Jesus' name. Trouble go. Hey, like that. That's the way I talk to trouble. Trouble out of here. Now in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for the anointing in Robert's life. I thank you for change. I'll break the power of every addiction now in Jesus' name. Healed, touched, touched, blessed. I bless you now in Jesus' name. Fire God comes on you. I bless you now in Jesus' name. Out of your belly. Blessed now in Jesus' name. Filled, filled, filled. Sickness cannot be in your house, has to depart out of your house. Has to leave, has to go in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Got to hurry. Fire! God. So do you papa beat it? Peace to the dynamus. Iktai, Uropatan. In Jesus' name, from the crown of your head, so is your feet. Fire, God, fire, God, fire. Yeah, more. It's coming right through the realms of heaven. Hallelujah. Into your soul right now. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Hallelujah. Strong. I command you to be strong in the strength of the Lord and in the power of His might. Hallelujah. Filled. 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 Strengthened right now in Jesus' name. You can do it. Hallelujah. Those same works Jesus did, you can do them. <laughs> You can do those same works Jesus did. You just need to be strengthened. You know that? You know that? You know that? You know Samson could do great things as soon as the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and strengthened him. Do you know that? You can read about that in Judges. Amer Native Americans, you know. The fire of God in Jesus' name. From the crown of your head to the soldier of your feet. Sickness out of this body now. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for the anointing of the Holy Ghost right here in this life. Praise God. Hallelujah. Fire God. Fire God on the big guy. Hallelujah. Fire God right here in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, made perfectly whole. And now receive. Changed right now. Fire God right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for taking this Baptist boy and turning him into a Pentecostal boy. In Jesus' name. John was a Baptist. Jesus was a Pentecostal. <laughs> Hallelujah. Right now. Be healed right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Be healed from the crown of your head. So is your feet. Touched by the power of God. In Jesus' name. Touch these babies, Lord, in Jesus' name. I command sickness to depart out of your house in Jesus' name. 
right now the blessing of God upon your life. Now, change from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. I say holiness unto the Lord in Jesus' name. Fire of God, I call down fire upon your life in Jesus' name. Touched by the presence of the Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, Father, thank you for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for the wonderful realms of heaven. When we get thirsty, out of our belly flows rivers of... <laughs> Holy Ghost. Fire God right there in your life. I command a blessing of God upon you now in Jesus' name. Healed. Healed right now in Jesus' name. Touched. Touched. Fire God right there. 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 Hallelujah. 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 Now, now, what I've received, what I've received, I freely give. What I've received from the Lord, the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, discerning of spirits, working of miracles, gifts of healing, gift of faith, prophecy, tongues, interpretation of tongues, dreams, visions. I've freely given. Hallelujah. Sure, start moving. Start moving. Start moving. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Go everywhere preaching the gospel. Hallelujah. Catherine Coleman, Catherine Coleman, a little girl in Concordia, uh, Missouri, was sitting in a Methodist church with more than less than 50 people, touched by the power of God and changed. Grows up to be a little bit older, knows the call of God's part of life. All she knew was the message of salvation. She goes and she did what the Lord told her to do. She was faithful to do what God told her to do. Then she encounters one day the Holy Ghost as the Holy Ghost is pouring out. Never seen the Holy Ghost work like this. The Holy Ghost was poured out in a meeting of three people. A girl just gave her life to Jesus. Suddenly anointing of God came upon her. She began speaking in heavenly language. Kathy Coleman says the most beautiful thing she's ever seen. She herself then stepped into a greater anointing. And we saw how she changed the generation. She did. She did. If Chuck Smith was still alive, he would testify what Catherine Coleman was to his life. He would. That's why there's a lot of pictures of Chuck Smith and Lonnie Friesby and a few other folks sitting around with Catherine Coleman up at Melody Land. Those were the days. Back in the day. True. And we can go on for so many other people as well. Look. God wants to change this generation. Change the landscape of San Diego County. Not by human effort. Not by might, not by power, but by the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. <laughs> through mighty signs and wonders that are only going to happen through people made confident and bold and brave by the Holy Ghost. Because you can see Peter and all the rest of them, they're afraid. They're hiding behind closed doors. Oh, they're going to come get us too. Then all of a sudden, the power of God was poured out upon him. And they became bold men. They staggered out into the streets of the most religious city on the face of the earth. The most antagonistic city to the message of Jesus Christ. 3,000 people were saved. <laughs> In a company of people that first thought they were looking at a bunch of folks that were drunk. With wine. I believe... I am confident that God's going to do the exact same thing yes, again. He is. Amen. Amen. Somebody said, I thought he was going to do a new thing. <clears throat> he is. His new thing is the thing he's always done. He just does it again and it's new. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Just lift your hands towards heaven. <sighs> right now in the name of Jesus Christ. I breathe on you and I command you receive the Holy Ghost and I tell you where the Holy Spirit comes every other spirit has to go hallelujah receive right now receive right now receive right now receive right now, receive right now. strengths strengths to live out Thursday Friday Saturday for the living God strengths to live in the dimensions of his divine power and glory and authority strength right now in Jesus name to live in the realms of heaven and not in the realm of earth. Strength, 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 
strength upon you now in Jesus' name. Strength to walk in the beauty of holiness. Hallelujah. Oh, please don't talk about catality. Dear people, <laughs> I want you to hook up with a miracle. I want you to hook up with a miracle with me tonight, and we're gonna we're gonna come in agreement for a miracle. Okay? You need a miracle of financial provision. The church needs a miracle of financial provision. So we're going to hook up in faith together to see a miracle take place in both your life and in the church's life. Come here. There's somebody here you have pain in your stomach and there's at least one person here specifically that the Lord pointed out you are struggling with depression and anxiety and it is cooperation with a demonic spirit and it is holding you back from your inheritance and you need to come up here right now and be healed of it. Okay, so I'm gonna just I'm just gonna say this again. You've got a problem in your stomach, and then another person has dealing with anxiety and fear. Are you the anxiety and fear person? Okay. So Veronica, you're gonna go after it right now in the name of Jesus. You're gonna kill that demon spirit to live. There you go. Now just lay your hands on time to receive. That's it. That's it. That's it. Hallelujah. Now, there it is, the stomach. I love this. It's a UCSD medical student over here. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. There's at least one other person right here who has depression and anxiety. Well, that, well, you just got one right there. You need to come up right now. So there's someone else with depression and anxiety. <laughs> and your gets broken right now. I set you free in the name of Jesus Christ. I set you free. You are no longer to be tormented by that. In Jesus' name, you walk into your inheritance right now. In Jesus' name, I kill you. Now just lay your hands on her and tell her to receive. Receive right now. Veronica's going to Asia with me. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. I mean, I see in Japan, I see so many radical young people that are ready to be released into the kingdom of God. I'm telling you, Japan is getting ready to be absolutely turned upside down by the power and authority of God. And let me say this. I see in this place right now so many people ready to be endowed with power from on high and be turned loose with the power of God upon Southern California and rock this region, which will ultimately result in this nation turning back to God. Overwhelmed with the glory of His presence. Hallelujah. Now, you can interrupt me anytime like that with word of knowledge, whatever, prophecy. Paul said, what should it profit to you if I come speaking to you in tongues? Lest I speak also by knowledge, <laughs> by revelation, by prophecy, and by doctrine. 1 Corinthians 14, 6. This is the way we practice. Hallelujah. If the Word of God says it, we're going to do it. Say that. Say, if the Word of God says it, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. Amen. Hallelujah. Because <laughs> all heaven's backing up God's word. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that glorious? Isn't that, isn't that powerful? Yeah, what's happening? So I just got a feeling like I wanted to talk about my brother died. Now he's had a, had a wall on fire around us, has a wall of protection. 
unifier around, around his people, around God's people. He really does. Yeah. He truly does. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. That's awesome. What's your name, by the way? Chris? Chris is saying something so powerful, so true. We the apple of God's eye. He's got a wall of fire, a hedge of protection about us. And it's so true. I mean, when we grab a hold of that, Satan can't even touch us, man. I mean, that's what he said about Job. Job just had a hedge. We baptized in the Holy Ghost in fire. That's why John said in 1 John 5, 18, he said, we kept by the power of God. Everyone who is born of God does not sin. He keeps himself and the wicked one has no access. Wow. I mean, to have that confidence. Somebody, because we look at it and we go, sin, it's an impossibility. I mean, we got to sin, man. we got to have some more. I mean, you know, but look, if you touch heaven and you touch the pleasures of that realm, there's no way. When you're walking it out second by second, minute by minute with the Lord Jesus Christ, there's nothing better than that. Nothing better than that. I said, they nothing better than, 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 than drinking of these waters of life, enjoying the pleasures that are in his presence, the joy that is in his presence, the pleasures that are at his right hand. Hey, how is your body doing? You're doing good? He's doing good? Heart's doing good? Isn't it awesome? You're looking good. Praise God. Father, we thank you. He gave us a new heart and a new spirit, both spiritually and physically. Amen. Amen. <laughs> As I was saying, we're hooking up with a miracle, for a miracle. Come, 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 come stand up. I want to hold your hand for just a minute. Just come stand with me. We're hooking, I want you to hook up with a miracle. Come over here. I want you to hook up with a miracle. We're going to hook up a miracle together. You need finances. We need, the church needs finances. And here's the Lord's provision. He said this. He said, give me a hand. He said this. He said that, um, thank you, Lord Jesus, for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. You ain't suffer no more. People think people die and go to hell and get tormented of the devil. So he's tormenting people with sickness and disease all over the place. God doesn't want it. The Lord Jesus doesn't want it. Can't be. I'm not going to stand for it. Amen. Not when I know that my master, I'm, I'm just a servant under my master's bid, doing my master's bidding, obeying what he's spoken in his word. The results belong to him. I mean, I'm going to get, but we get after it with a determination and a passion that's hooked up so that we care with. Our, uh, with that, a responsibility, you know. We feel it, we feel the responsibility. And I'm happy to do that, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Paul gave us a remedy. <laughs> Hallelujah. He said that, he said that if you give, Jesus said it first, if you give, then the Lord would cause you to have it given, finances given to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Then Paul says, that if you sow and you give through giving, uh, then you're going to have all grace abound into you so you'll have all sufficiency in all things. And he puts it like this. He says, if you sow a little, you're going to reap a little. But praise God for a little reaping. Some people only have faith to sow a little. Huh? Look, I have faith for that property over there, that six acres with 70,000 square feet of building space. It basically cost $18 million. I have faith for that. I, I, honestly, I do not have faith right now for um, Qualcomm Stadium. It's a little more pricey. <laughs> and plus, it holds a whole lot more people. Are you with me? Huh? But I'm, I'm going after that. I'm kicking up for that. Are you with me? Yeah. Come on now. And so the Lord says to us that if we sow little, we'll reap a little. And then it's not just finances. It's spiritual blessings, too. Huh? To be blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly realm. It's both, it's both prospering in your soul, in your physical body, and in your finances. So he said, but if you sow generously, you shall also reap generously. And God is able to make all grace abound unto you so that you have all sufficiency in all things. Wow, that's a lot of sufficiency. So that means then, when you begin, you need a financial miracle. So then, if you come and you begin to sow for your financial miracle, God's promised that you're going to reap a harvest. No, he expects you to give in five different areas. To the orphans, to the widows, to the poor and the needy, to the traveling ministry, and to the local church. And he expects you to do that continually. Well, that sounds like a whole lot of provision to me. Doesn't it to you? I mean, we're going to have to hook up with his way to have that kind of provision because nobody makes that kind of money normally. Are you with me? So it's a supernatural supply provision. Do you believe that? Well, I believe it because God's promised and he can't lie. God's not unethical. 
He's not going to break his promise. Hallelujah. He's watch over his word to perform it. Praise God. So I just, I want, you know, let me just tell you, dear people. We, we in it straight betwixt two things. We know the longer we sit around here, the deeper we go in the anointing. I praise God for what happened on Sunday night and people willing to stay late. And then, you know, where we're here in this building, guys are staying even later, breaking everything down and whatnot, you know, getting all the stuff cleaned up. And we so appreciate that. It's not a blessing to us. And uh, I want to encourage you. Don't just walk out of this presence of the Lord, this place where God's dealing with you. Take you deeper. Stay there. Stay there. Um, you'll discover that as you seek his face, his presence will be found of you. An overwhelming, tangible presence of joy and peace and goodness. Wow. Tangible presence of the Holy Ghost. So, we want you to worship the Lord in giving tonight. And we want you to hook up with the miracle of faith. I want you to understand this. The smallest acts of obedience create the greatest miracles of faith. Let me prove it to you. Okay? Quickly. A small act of obedience. You called upon the name of the Lord. The greatest miracle of faith took place. You were changed. You got a new heart, a new spirit. You were born again. The miracle of salvation came in your life. Wow. It just works, it works that way from there on out. Amen. You began in the spirit to be finished by the spirit. Hallelujah. 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 So let's come worship the Lord with your giving. Strength comes in your body. In Jesus' name.